Microsoft, like many big tech companies, has had a history of ups, downs, and major transitions. And I think one of the best ways to understand a company's history is through the lens of their website. I recently made a video called History of Apple's Website, and I realized that a lot of their history intertwines with Microsoft, especially in the early days. And that realization is what inspired me to make this video pointing out those crucial moments in Microsoft's history as represented by their website. Site. This is Greg with Apple Explained, and I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you want to help decide which video topics I cover, make sure you're subscribed, and polls like this one will show up in your mobile activity feed. Now, let's begin by discussing how Microsoft got their big break in 1980, which had everything to do with IBM. You see, at that time, the personal computer market was dominated by three companies, Commodore, Tandy, and Apple. IBM dominated the mainframe market and quickly recognized the importance of personal computers. They wanted to make a model of their own, but didn't have the operating system necessary to make it happen. That's where Microsoft came in. They promised IBM a disk operating system, or DOS for short, similar to what Apple had for their Apple II computer in 1978. IBM accepted the offer and gave Microsoft a contract to develop what would become IBM PC DOS, included in the 1981 IBM personal computer. Now, I say all that not because it has anything to do with Microsoft's website, but because it kicked off a decade of legal battles with the US government that would not only affect the company's website, but also the future of Apple. You see, in 1990, the Federal Trade Commission investigated Microsoft for possible collusion with IBM to manipulate the software market. And although Microsoft eventually settled the antitrust charges in 1994, the company continued to be heavily monitored by the Justice Department for any signs of anti-competitive behavior. And this is where Microsoft's website comes in. But before talking about their site, I'm going to take the opportunity to talk about mine, which is appleexplain.com. And although it isn't full of content, it does have a very important purpose. It allowed me to buy the appleexplain.com domain before anyone else, and therefore claim a custom email address, info at appleexplain.com. And I was able to claim my domain name, build my website, and create a custom email address all with the same service, and that's Squarespace. I've been using Squarespace for over a year now after switching between other services, and I'm really happy with what they have to offer. Squarespace had the highest number of website templates to choose from, and they're all optimized for mobile, so I didn't have to do any extra work editing my site for tablets or smartphones. And when I wanted to sell a merch product, I was able to add an e commerce store to my site without starting over from scratch. Plus, the payment processor was built in and I could print shipping labels straight from Squarespace too. When I say it's an all-in-one platform, I really mean it. And you can get all this for cheaper than you might think, especially if you use the link squarespace.com slash Apple Explained, since you'll get 10% off your first purchase. You can find that link in the description. Now, Microsoft's battle with the Justice Department reached a fever pitch in 1998, when Microsoft was finally sued for abusing their power to suppress competition, particularly when it came to their internet browser called Netscape, which became so ubiquitous that it was even shipped as a default browser on Macintosh computers. But Microsoft refused to stand idly by while the Justice Department accused them of illegal monopolistic practices. They actually used their website as a means to defend themselves in the court of public opinion. It began in 1998 with a relatively small side banner asking what visitors thought about the lawsuit, but quickly adopting a more prominent position in the center of the website, as well as a more suggestive message. No longer was Microsoft simply informing visitors with the title Microsoft and the DOJ. They were now making an argument with the title Microsoft and the Freedom to Innovate. And as the case intensified in 1999, Microsoft began an all-out offensive against the Justice Department's accusations. And nowhere was this aggressive posture more apparent than on their website, which was completely overhauled. The usual Microsoft software products and news updates were replaced by information about something called the Freedom to Innovate Network, which claimed to be a nonpartisan grassroots network of citizens and businesses who had a stake in the success of Microsoft. 
Now, it's questionable how much of a grassroots movement the Freedom to Innovate Network was, especially considering it was formed by Microsoft and advertised to the public through their own website. But it was clear that the company was trying to form a narrative that had a chance of influencing the outcome of their legal case. But I should mention that this had been their strategy since before the Justice Department actually filed their lawsuit. Because back in 1997, Microsoft made a substantial $150 million investment in Apple. And although that surprised many, it actually made a lot of sense for both companies. Apple was guaranteed at least five more years of Microsoft Office development for the Mac, influence over the creation of Java, and access to Microsoft's patents. But perhaps the most important aspect of the deal was ensuring that Microsoft had a vested interest in Apple's success. Because as we already know, Microsoft had developed a reputation of monopolizing the software market by either forcing companies out or simply buying them out. But this wasn't a sustainable business model for Microsoft. They knew the Justice Department was eager to file a lawsuit which had the potential of breaking up the company, something they wanted to avoid at all costs. So Microsoft needed Apple to succeed as much as Apple themselves. If not, it'd be very hard for Microsoft to argue against having a monopoly over the software market, considering about 95% of all personal computers ran Windows at that time. But there were more benefits for the company than simply strengthening their position in a potential legal battle with the Justice Department. Microsoft was also released from a long-standing lawsuit from Apple over stealing the look and feel of the Macintosh operating system. Their Internet Explorer brand browser would ship as the default on every Mac, and they actually made a substantial amount of money from their investment as Apple became profitable. Now, in 2000, the judge overseeing the case ruled that Microsoft had to be broken up into two separate entities, one to make the operating system and another to make other software like the internet browser. But as you can imagine, Microsoft fought the judgment by filing an appeal and making another argument on their website with an article titled, Microsoft urges court to dismiss government's breakup proposal. And again, they were successful. In 2001, the Justice Department announced they were no longer seeking to break up Microsoft. Instead, they decided to pursue a less serious antitrust penalty. Now, as that legal battle came to an end, Microsoft's website quickly returned to normal, featuring news like the demise of Clippy and pre-order availability of Windows XP. And when that operating system actually launched, Microsoft's website was slightly remodeled to reflect the design language used in Windows XP. Now, at this point, Apple had been enjoying profitability for about three years, and despite working closely with Microsoft in some areas, Apple had a very different way of doing business. And those differences could be seen by simply taking a look at each company's website. Back in 2001, Microsoft's homepage was very text heavy with few photos and very little white space. It was clear they were trying to squeeze as much information on the page as possible. Compare that to Apple's site during the same period, which dedicated almost the entire homepage to just one product, the iPod. Rather than providing links to as many news articles, products, and pages as possible, Apple instead directed visitors' attention to just one thing, ensuring a clear message that anyone could understand in just seconds. And as we learned in my previous video, that approach to web design was pretty revolutionary at the time, but it quickly became the industry standard. Just take a look at how Microsoft's website changed by 2004. Suddenly, they were featuring less text links in favor of banner images with a clear message. This is when Microsoft began thinking of their homepage as a storefront rather than a site map with endless links. And that shift makes sense when you consider the company's focus on hardware during this time. They created the Xbox in 2001, which became one of the best-selling consoles in the country. But their second major product, the Zune Music Player, wasn't as successful. It launched in 2007 and was featured on Microsoft's homepage, which was redesigned yet again with an even greater focus on banner images. But the Zune never caught on and was dominated by the iPod until it was discontinued in 2011 after just four years on the market. Now, it was during this period when Microsoft entered a number of markets, including smartphones and tablets, in addition to rebranding of their logo, products, and operating systems. It was all centered around their new Metro design language that debuted on their smartphones, and you can see how this new style influenced their website. 
By 2012, Microsoft's homepage looked like a completely different place. It adopted a responsive design and prominently displayed hardware, like the Surface tablet or Windows Phone, which was a big change from the software-centric approach they took just a year earlier. And that change in web design coincided with Microsoft's changing business strategy, primarily driven by new hardware. They introduced the Kinect, Microsoft Band, Surface Book, and Microsoft Surface Hub, all within four years, many of which were featured on the company's homepage during their release. Now, Microsoft has stuck to this responsive, modern website design for the past few years, and they'll likely continue using it for many years to come. But their focus may be shifting from the consumer market to the business and government markets. They've recently worked with Toyota, the U.S. military, and 17 American intelligence agencies, providing various technology to improve and streamline their operations. So while Microsoft may not be experiencing much success in the consumer market, they are making a substantial profit from other companies and government agencies, which could become the main focus of Microsoft's business strategy and homepage going forward. Alright guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.